Dobar den na svite gledači na kanal TED Televizije, odnosno na Milenko Nedotovski show. U momentu se navodim na ulica Varen, u centru na Paris, na nekog desetna metri od kancelarijata na premijera, na premijera, na francuska ta republika, a su ovo kancelarijata na nevladine organizacije, koja su godini uspešno ja vodi moj prijatelj John Lachlan. Če se obidam, nego da go intervjuiram i zato ga dobijeme svi te možne informacije o vrske so Brexit, britansko izlagovanje od Evropske unije, kako čovjek koji ima diplomirano i doktorirano v Anglija na elitni univerzitet, a ovde ka na prvi univerzitet v Francija na Sorbona on trži predavanja. Ušte jedna, što znači se navodljame v prostorija koja je v centar na Paris i koja je v ulicata na vladinite instituciji, organizaciji i ministarstva. John, thank you very much for your time and your patience. The Macedonian public would like to hear from you. You are an Englishman, actually a Brit. Who, who studied and graduated in, in, in Britain, and now you are working in France. So, first of all, um, uh, your opinion, general opinion, about Brexit. Well, I was very happy at the result. I've uh, campaigned in my writings and in my political commentary now for more than 20 years against the European Union and against its authoritarian and undemocratic tendencies. I've uh, argued in many books and many lectures that uh, nation states should control their own destiny and they should not be governed uh, from outside by foreigners uh, and certainly not in an undemocratic way such as is the case now in the EU. So I'm extremely pleased that in spite of a, a very uh, strong campaign, a very sometimes rather aggressive campaign, uh, in fa if, by, on the part of those people who wanted Britain to remain in the European Union. I'm very pleased that uh, the vote was in favour of national independence and, for a fav and in favour of a return to democratic self-government because uh, Britain is uh, obviously one of the most powerful countries in the world. Uh, it's the second or third largest economy in the European Union. It's the largest military power in Europe. Uh, and. Uh, this decision, this vote, will uh, not only be good for Britain uh, because uh, we will be able to govern ourselves again and we will be able to trade with whomever we like, uh, but also it will, I hope, uh, in the longer term be good for the European Union because the European Union doesn't work. Uh, it is increasingly authoritarian and undemocratic. It is incapable of solving problems <clears throat> and, in fact, its structures are making problems worse. The way that it operates actually makes things worse in Europe. <clears throat> and, um, you know, there are various scenarios now for the future, but all of them, uh, I'm not saying that the future will be easy, but all of them point to uh, an end to the European Union. Not tomorrow, not next year, but over time, because the system cannot carry on as it has before. British democracy has a long history, with a lot of turbulences but long history which uh, shows uh, what are the, the advantages of democracy. Uh, but uh, in the last uh, decades, uh, Great Britain became part of European Union, the, as the company uh, which uh, is not democratic. And the first thing, first of all, is that the people who are running the European Union and all the countries, they are not elected by the people. That's right. The Commission is not elected. The Commission is the most powerful organization in the European Union. It has a monopoly over legislation. Nothing can become law in Europe unless, in the European Union, unless the Commission initiates it. So no member of the European Parliament, no government minister, and certainly no citizen can initiate any any legislative process. And citizens are not elected that person. And, and, and above persons. all, the commissioners are not elected, neither the commissioners themselves nor, of course, anybody who works. There are, I think, 30,000 
uh, civil servants who work in the commission, they are obviously simply functionaries. But the commissioners themselves, the College of Commissioners, who are, if you like, the ministers of the European Union, are not elected. Nor, nor is, uh, of course, the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, he is not elected. He is simply uh, chosen from, uh, by other uh, heads of government. Uh, the European Parliament is not democratic. Uh, in the sense that it does not have a government accountable to it. It doesn't, normally parliaments control a government. Well, the European Commission is not controlled by the European Parliament. Um, and, uh, of course, there are many other ways in which the European Parliament is undemocratic as well. And in a sense, the most undemocratic part of the European Union is the fact that laws are made in the European Union uh, after a vote taken in secret in the Council of Ministers. In other words, the governments of the European Union get together, they meet in this Council of Ministers, and they decide uh, between themselves what becomes law. In other words, lawmaking is taken away from national parliaments and given instead to national governments sitting in the Council of Ministers. So all these things are you know, fundamental violations of the basic rules of democracy. And yet, these same people, these same people who are not elected, not accountable, uh, and who vote laws in secret, and who overrule referendums. Uh, there have been uh, referendums in other countries that have been, in Greece, for example, your own neighbour, uh, but also in this country, which have been ignored by the European elites. These people set themselves up uh, as the uh, great Democrats and the great, uh, they're great givers of lessons to everybody else about the meaning of democracy. Well, they've now been uh, defeated those people. Uh, John, if we can compare uh, European Council in some historical regimes, or where, where can we find? Comparison? Well, I've often argued that the European Union resembles the Soviet Union, uh, except uh, without the historical uh, basis that the Soviet Union had. The Soviet Union was was Russia. It was the it was the, the Russian state uh, transformed into a, uh, a, a union of republics, but it, was, it, was, had, a, it had a historical existence uh, as a state long before the Soviet Union existed. The European Union resembles the Soviet Union in the sense that uh, it is inspired by the same post-national ideology, the same uh, progressivist or supposedly progressivist ideology. People in the early Bolshevik period thought that uh, nations were finished, that uh, the whole world would evolve towards communism, and that the Soviet Union was only the beginning of a world union uh, of uh, future communist states. I'm talking about the early Soviet period. The European Union uh, believes much the same thing. It believes that it has discovered the secret to uh, universal human life, and that uh, its truths, the truths that it believes in and the truths that it embodies, apply to everyone equally, uh, and that the European Union will grow larger and larger, uh, taking in ever more countries, the countries of the Balkans, Turkey, uh, and that you know, ultimately the whole world, not the whole world will join the European Union, but the whole world will somehow one day have a, a single political system based on liberalism, human rights, and free trade, and so on. But without voting. But without voting, exactly. Or at least voting, uh, but providing that you give the right answer when you're asked to vote. So you can't vote against the system. And the commission itself and the commissioners are like uh, commissioners in Soviet Union? Well, exactly. In, uh, in many languages, not in English, but in many languages, uh, it's the same word. We, in English, said commissars. For, uh, but uh, in, I'm sure in Macedonian commissar. it's the same word. In French it's the same word. Political commissar. Yeah, exactly. And in, in the, it's only in English actually we have a different word. But in fact we should, we should in English use the word commissars and not commissioners because that would remind people of the historical precedent because for this. In, in the, during the World War and after that, Second World War, political commissars in the brigades were much powerful than yes. the commanders in Germany. Well, the, the political commissars in, in 
communist systems were a little bit different. They were political officers in factories or in uh, governmental structures. But I mean, you know, the, the point is, is the same. It's that they regard themselves, and they are in, in terms of the treaties, they are the guardians of the European idea. They have to drive forward the European project. They have to ensure this ever closer union. Uh, and, uh, and they are, of course, completely undemocratic. Strong democracy, strong countries like France, like Great Britain, allow that to happen? Well, France and Britain have very different democratic traditions. Um, of course, France has a uh, long... Tr well, uh, France has been democratic uh, a long time ago. So in the French Revolution, fr at the time of the French Revolution, strictly speaking, France was more democratic than the United Kingdom because uh, the franchise in the French Revolution was much bigger. There were four or five million electors in revolutionary France, whereas in England there were probably uh, a million or so, because the franchise was very small. Even though we had a parliamentary system, it was not, we cannot yet say that it was a, a fully democratic system. But France also has uh, a strong history of very authoritarian government, uh, Napoleon, uh, the French kings, uh, and so on. Uh, and France, unlike Britain, does not have a strong tradition of parliamentary government. The parliament in France is, is quite weak. In the Fifth Republic, it's certainly uh, it's weaker than it was in earlier constitutions. So we have different, we have different uh, traditions. And uh, uh, the, fa the, re the reason why France has been able to um, remain in the European Union is that uh, for many decades, France had a very strong position within the European Union. Uh, France uh, dominated the European Union in the immediate post-war period. So naturally, the French elites liked the European Union because they felt at home with it, they had helped build it, and largely speaking, they dominated it. In the last 25 years, however, that has changed with the reunification of Germany. It's now Germany which is the most powerful country. Uh, and indeed, all European decisions now, all European Union decisions are taken by Mrs. Merkel. We all know that. Uh, France has, uh, has almost no say at all anymore, a very minor say in comparison to Germany. And one of the consequences of this is that uh, the French people are increasingly anti-European. They're increasingly hostile to the European Union. Let's not forget that in 2005, France voted against the European Constitution, uh, just as the Netherlands did. So many of the, uh, old, as you say, old democracies in Europe are voting against the European Union. The Netherlands just voted against the uh, association agreement with Ukraine in a referendum that was widely understood as being against the European Union in general. The Netherlands voted like France in 2005 against the Constitution. So these old countries, these old demo democracies, they're all old countries, but these old democracies are voting against the European Union. And that's why I say that the British vote will lead in time to the collapse of the European Union uh, as a whole, because countries like France and the Netherlands will start to vote against it. Um, let's uh, go back to Great Britain. Over there is obviously that uh, to stay in Europe vote London, and of course Northern, Northern Ireland, Scotland, because of the hostile to English. But all the ordinary people, normal people, normal Englishmen, normal Brits, um, people who are from Britain, they vote uh, against, um, vote out. Tell me uh, two things. First, uh, what do you think about that diversity? And the second thing, what go going out of from European me Union means from the ordinary Englishman in some, in Preston or in, yeah. uh, in Brighton, uh, yeah. somewhere. Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, the vote was a provincial vote, a provincial English vote. Uh, and uh, London, of course, stood out with a very high uh, percentage of people voting to remain in the European Union. But look, I've been saying to people for years, London is not an English city. As London Paris, is not an English city. Paris is not France. Uh, no, French, no, Paris is a French city. Most people, most of the inhabitants of Paris are French, mm -hmm. but most of the inhabitants of London are not English, are not British. Mm -hmm. 
the white British are in a minority in London. Anybody who goes to London can see that and the official statistics confirm it. So London is a world city like New York used to be. It, uh, it has no uh, allegiance, uh, as it were, to England. Its residents are not, are not from England and they don't, uh, they don't have any allegiance to England. And they don't feel... And they're not, they're not English. They just they are not. Many of them are foreigners and uh, those who may have British citizenship uh, are either uh, from immigrant families, or from India, from the Caribbean, from Africa, from wherever. Uh, so, um, so that's why London voted as it did. What does it mean for the ordinary, ordinary. Brit the ordinary person in an English provincial town? voted against the European Union, firstly because the European Union has never been popular in uh, Britain. No British government has ever uh, argued fully in favour of the European Union. They have always sold the European Union as an unfortunate necessity, as something that we don't really like, uh, we, we know it doesn't work very well, but we have to have commercial relations with the European continent and it's best to be in the single market than out of it. That has always been the argument and um, it's, uh, it was the same during this campaign. For, by and large, the British bought that argument. They bought it. Britain has a long history of trade. It's a world country with a world empire in recent memory. Uh, it, uh, it's always had communications uh, with countries all over the world, including in obviously very distant countries like Canada, Australia, America, the Far East and so on, India. Um, but th what has changed uh, in uh, the last uh, decade, in the last 15 years, is that the British have realized that this liberal regime, this liberal trading regime in the European Union also means liberalism where immigration is concerned. And uh, the fact is that in the European Union today, and indeed for the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, there are only two economies that function properly, Germany and Britain. Germany because the euro was designed for Germany uh, and because it gives Germany the ability to export massively to the rest of Europe and indeed to the world. Because if Germany did not have the euro, then the Deutschmark would have risen in value because of the strength of the German economy, just like the Swiss franc uh, has risen in value. Uh, and, and this, of course, puts a dampening effect on imports. The Swiss uh, struggle with their strong currency because Switzerland, like Germany, exports a lot of industrial goods. But unlike Germany, uh, the Swiss currency rises when people want to buy more and more Swiss goods. The Swiss currency rises. The German currency, which is the euro, doesn't rise because it's kept artificially low uh, because we have Italy and Spain and Greece and so on in, in the eurozone. So Germany does extremely well and as a result the German economy is doing well. Uh, Britain does very well because it's not in the euro. It doesn't have the downward effect uh, which the euro exercises on, on eurozone countries. <clears throat> and that's why the the wave of migration, I'm not talking about the wave in the last year, where of course uh, the, the figures reached, uh, uh, you know, went up uh, very dramatically. I'm talking about the hundreds of thousands of people that have been migrating to Britain uh, ever since 2004, uh, when the Central and Eastern European countries joined, when Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Malta, Cyprus, all those countries joined in 2004. Area. Well, that was in 2007. But uh, uh, ever since Poland joined, and Poland is the biggest country, uh, uh, something like two million Poles have gone, have gone to, uh, to Britain. Poland has quite simply exported its unemployment to Britain, very simply. Now, two million people uh, is a big movement of population. It's a very big movement of population, and it affects the daily lives of people in these provincial towns. It means that the builders are all Polish, the agricultural workers are all from Romania, uh, the shopkeepers are all uh, from God knows where. Hospital. The hospital staff, are, a very, very large number of hospital staff come from Spain or from, from wherever. Uh, because uh, why uncontrolled? Because it's part of the it's part of the rules of the European single market that you have to have free movement of labour, and that is the uh, contradiction, if you like, which the British now have rejected. They have said we don't want 
uh, unlimited free movement of labor as part of the single market. Because though those immigrants uh, or refugees, or anybody, they don't want to travel thousands of miles and to to reach, to come to, to Skopje or to Sofia or even to Portugal. They would like to be in Germany or in... Well, because Germany. there aren't any jobs in these countries. The unemployment rate in Italy and in Greece, the youth unemployment rate is 50%. 50%. Uh, it's, I don't know what it is in Spain or Portugal for the youth unemployment, but the over... 45. Yes, and the overall, un the overall unemployment rate is over 20%. These countries are dying on their feet. Of course there are no jobs. In, there are jobs in Germany, there are jobs in Britain, and there may be some jobs in Scandinavia. That's it. Exactly. That's it. So that's why people go, and it's a, tr it's a tragedy for them. It's bad enough for the country that receives them, because it creates a lot of social problems. But uh, what about the poor people uh, who have to leave Poland uh, and travel for thousands of uh, kilometers uh, to find work? I mean, that is the European ideal. I regard it as a human drama. In uh, neighboring Bulgaria, we have a problem that uh, people, young people left Bulgaria. Now there is a big problem finding uh, workers well, for industry, for factories. Hard time workers to find the people who can work on, uh, in agriculture. It's very difficult now. Suddenly there is not enough. But this is the neoliberal model. This is the model that has been put to us, been sold to us, as the future of Europe. But there is no food in that. Well, exactly. It's crazy. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, as you say, the, the uh, Western Ukrainians uh, go to work, go to pick strawberries in Slovakia or in the mm -hmm. Czech Republic. The Eastern Ukrainians go to Russia uh, or Bulgaria or God knows where. Uh, everybody is going somewhere else, uh, and uh, in my view, this needs to be corrected. Uh, people should not be encouraged uh, to leave their country and go and work thousands of kilometers away. It's not good for the country where they go to, and it's not good for the country that they leave. Back to Britain once again. Um, uh, uh, the high British authorities, officials, give uh, totally different statements in a period of few days. Three days, five days, seven days, totally different. The one, the same person, one idea this Monday, the other yeah. idea next Monday. Um, are you following that? Can, can you give yes, I mean, uh, the, the, the campaign was waged by the government, by most of the government, uh, and also by the opposition. Uh, on the basis of what the supporters of Brexit called Project Fear. So okay. the idea was, uh, and it's, it's undoubtedly the case, that instead of campaigning in positively in favour of Europe and saying Europe is wonderful, of course they said that as well, but they mainly tried to frighten people. They tried to frighten people um, about the economic consequences. They tried to frighten people about their pensions. Jobs, salaries. And jobs. Uh, and, uh, for example, the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, uh, said that uh, there would have to be an emergency budget, that taxes would have to rise, that 500,000 jobs would be lost. That was before? That was before. The uh, day of vote. And then uh, on the day after the vote, on the first working day, uh, well, there was Friday, but on the Monday, so today, Monday the uh, 27th of June, he went, uh, gave a press conference at 7 o'clock in the morning before the markets opened to try to calm everybody down. There's no question of an emergency budget. There's no question of 500,000 jobs going. And there's no question of a recession. He, on the contrary, said the British economy is strong uh, and uh, we will make this work. So, you know, people who were frightened into voting remain, uh, I hope, will now see that actually uh, the fears were exaggerated and that if this issue is properly managed, the underlying strength of the British economy will indeed allow us to go through these changes and come out uh, better on the other side. Journalists in Great Britain are asking him about? Absolutely, of course they are. There was uh, uh, an interview on Sunday, yesterday, Sunday the 26th of June, uh, with the business secretary 
uh, where uh, one of the most famous television journalists, Andrew Marr, said, but look, you promised us uh, an emergency budget, or you've tried to frighten us with an emergency budget. Are you going to have one? He denied. He said, no, we're not going to have one. He said, what about the 500,000 jobs you said would be lost? This minister said, well, actually, no, uh, the British economy is strong. So I think the Remain camp has now been shown up uh, for, for the dishonest information that it tried to uh, make people believe in. Um, now, about Europe. What the Brexit means for European countries? Old European and young European countries? Well, uh, we will have to wait and see. I mean, my fear is that the old elites, the old, the same old politicians who've been going round and round and round now in France, in Germany, who are in power, who've been in power for 10 years or more. Uh, I'm talking about François Hollande, Angela Merkel, Nicolas Sarkozy, all these people uh, will uh, say what they say every single time uh, there's a crisis. And indeed, there have been many crises, crises in Europe, the Euro crisis, the migrant crisis, and so on. They always say the same thing, and that is we need more Europe. And in particular, the Germans, the German government, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, is determined to use the Brexit and the fear that other European leaders have that the European Union will collapse to force integration, in particular to push forward the banking union and possibly as well to have a fiscal union. Uh, in other words, to have sim similar taxes or even common European taxes in order to finance the Eurozone and to, keep, and to integrate the Eurozone uh, even more than it is already. If that happens, and if Germany pushes ahead with this plan, that will create, I'm absolutely certain, a very big counter-reaction in France. N definitely from the uh, anti-system parties like the Front National, but maybe also within the French elites. Maybe also within the French elites, because one of the consequences, I think, of Brexit is that France will realize now that she is, as it were, alone faced with this uh, hegemonic Germany. Uh, when Germany was reunited... Like be before World War II. <laughs> exactly. Because when Germany was reunited... Now, where is the Maginot line? Well, the Euro was the Maginot line, and it's failed, just like the Maginot line itself. And, uh, uh, you know, perhaps the French will have to wait until the Germans are in Paris again before they realize that the Maginot line didn't work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the fact is that uh, France tried to balance Germany uh, by uh, setting up a European defense identity with the British, a European, not a European army, but a European military capacity with the British. And that, as it were, was supposed to compensate for the economic hegemony, economic and political hegemony of, of Germany. Well, that is now in ruins now. That is now in ruins, because although even if Britain and France continue to cooperate militarily, the fact is that it will be outside the European Union. So I foresee uh, a, a big shift in the balance of power now between, within the, the core countries of the European Union. And German power, which uh, has already been dominant now for uh, nearly a decade since the introduction of the euro, uh, the Germans will now be seeing if they cannot consolidate their position and get treaty changes in place which will make it irreversible, as they think. And the countries like, for example, um, Hungary? Well, uh, interestingly, Poland, the Polish government, the new Polish government, uh, as I understand it, has called for exactly the opposite solution to the one proposed by France. France, uh, France and Germany. France and Germany have basically said more Europe. Poland has said, no, we need to be more flexible, we need to go back to national sovereignty and so on. So there may indeed be a disagreement opening up, an east-west disagreement between, as you say, on the one yeah, hand, yeah. Germany and Poland, obviously Hungary. Uh, Austria, of course, is... A, is, is, is you know, very nearly elected, uh, as we know, a Eurosceptic president, uh, may elect a Eurosceptic government if the Freedom Party wins there in next year's elections. So all these things, uh, you know, simply show that the, the integration process, the idea that we all need always, always more Europe, the wheels are coming off that project. When, when we're on that field, 
more and more Europe. What about, about Balkans? There are few big open questions. Serbia in European Union, Macedonia in European Union. What about Montenegro, Kosovo, Bosnia? There are open questions. Albania. Well, like a, I think they will remain open now uh, forever because uh, I cannot see how, uh, I mean, of course, uh, these countries could theoretically join. They, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Uh, but on the other hand, everybody can see that the European Union is in deep crisis. It's not just Brexit. Uh, it's the euro crisis. It's the migrant crisis. It's the collapse of the European economy. Um, way, way to go there. Exactly. Why, why would you join a sinking ship? Normally rats uh, leave a sinking ship. They don't rush aboard a sinking ship. So you wouldn't expect uh, uh, countries to join a project which is, which is failing. Uh, but the, 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 the problem is, just as in, uh, in the Central Europe, that the elites have for so long now, including in the Balkans, have for so long now thought that Europe is the answer to all their problems that indeed they will need to go through a long process of relearning reality. People, normal people, are now aware that uh, European Union is not the future for any country. Exactly. Big, powerful, rich, like France or Britain, or much smaller country like Serbia, like Macedonia. Yeah. Actually, what does it mean as a, as, a, as, a, as a signal to those small countries, to Macedonia? Well, I, I, mean, I, have, I have argued uh, for, for decades, and I said this, I argued this about the Central European states when they were in the accession process, which mm. the Balkan states are now in, that uh, one of the many negative effects of European integration is that it sucks accession countries towards Brussels, uh, at the expense of sensible regional cooperation between these countries. So in the 1990s, when the Central European states were accession countries, they were always in competition with, it, with each other, Poland against the Czech Republic, against Hungary and so on. They were all trying to be the best uh, in the class, to be the top of the class and to be most loved by Brussels. Instead of which, they were economies in a s similar situation, they had similar concerns and challenges. They obviously had a similar uh, history uh, with the uh, Warsaw Pact and so on. Uh, the same applies now to the Balkan states. Obviously the Yugoslav uh, republics, the former Yugoslav republics, have a shared and largely similar history. They've come from more or less the same place. They should devote their efforts not to trying to pr please uh, a distant European Commission in Brussels, but instead to working out practical solutions uh, at a regional level, so with their immediate neighbours, um, uh, instead, to make life better for people there. Uh, you know, next question, can we go uh, over the, across the ocean? What the, does Brexit mean to the United States? Well, uh, the Americans, of course, uh, historically have been very strongly in favour of European integration. Indeed, uh, the Americans basically created the European Union or created the European Coal and Steel Community, which later became the Economic Community and the European Union. Uh, and they've always regarded, and they created it, why? Because they wanted a united bloc in the Cold War uh, in Western Europe to stand up to the Eastern Bloc uh, uh, and to Russia. That was the, the, the purpose of creating the Coal and Steel Community, was to rearm Germany in 1950 and to create a European federal army uh, as part of the Cold War. That was the original idea. Uh, and ever since then, they've always supported uh, an integrated Europe as part of their overall uh, plan of uh, maintaining a, a bridgehead and, uh, and indeed a hegemonic presence on the European continent. There's absolutely no doubt about that. We saw during the campaign that President Obama um, uh, made an intervention, a strong intervention in favor of um, uh, Britain staying in the European Union uh, and it backfired. The British don't particularly like the Americans. They didn't appreciate uh, being told how to vote and there's absolutely no doubt that his intervention uh, had a negative effect and certainly failed to have a positive one. What will they do next? First of all, uh, America itself is in, uh, 
is in is in a pre-election stage right now, and we all know that one of the uh, candidates is Donald Trump. Donald Trump was in uh, Scotland uh, on the day of the Brexit vote, and he said he thought it was an excellent result. He said if he had been British, his mother is British, his mother is from Scotland, he said uh, that he would have voted uh, for Brexit. If he becomes president uh, this at the end of this year, then presumably uh, everything will be sorted out, or at least uh, uh, you know, the Americans will be happy, the new American administration will be happy. Uh, as far as the existing American elites are concerned, they will simply uh, try to adjust to the new reality. They will strengthen their uh, links with Britain on the level of intelligence cooperation and, of course, military cooperation through NATO. All those things will remain in place and possibly even be strengthened. Uh, now, actually, uh uh, NATO, NATO is in favor of this because NATO is the the only organization where all the Western European countries, Great Britain and United States, are in. So they are they are bigger and powerful, or <laughs> much powerful organization than European Union, actually. Absolutely, NATO is extremely powerful, and there's no there's no Brexit does not threaten uh, American hegemony through NATO in Europe. In the longer term, there is probably a loss to America if we assume that the same old geopolitical projects continue. They may not. Trump may genuinely change things. Who knows? Uh, but if, uh, say, Hillary Clinton is elected, then of course, yes, the old uh, American plan of dividing the European continent and, of course, uh, getting the European Union countries to uh, be hostile towards Russia, uh, that will continue. And if Britain is taken out of the equation, then I have to say that that plan uh, is weakened because one of the roles that Britain played in the European Union was, uh, in a sense, to keep an eye on Germany and to prevent uh, the tendency which exists in Germany for a better relationship with yeah. Russia. Uh, but uh, not, of course, the present German government, but there are other tendencies in Germany uh, who are in favor of that. Well, Britain is now out of the game, so the Americans will have to do it themselves directly, uh, and they will do that, I'm sure, fairly easily, because, of course, they have huge influence in Germany. What do you think, uh, Trump or, or Hillary? Uh, my s feeling is that Trump has a very good chance. Uh, the American presidential election, well, all, pres all American elections, have a very low turnout. Very few people vote in America. Uh, what Trump can do, perhaps, is to get people out, to get people to vote who previously didn't vote. Uh, of course, Hillary will try to play on people's fears and try and get people out to stop Trump. But to the extent that Trump can mobilize electors who perhaps didn't vote in the past, he has a very good chance. And if he wins, do you think that he will change something from his rhetorical uh, phases uh, before the elections about uh, migrants, Muslims, about even he said that he will uh, change in positive way policy to Macedonia and that he will uh, he will push out uh, from the office uh, American ambassador in Skopje and so on. So he put yeah. What do you think? He will stay on that, or maybe the corporations, yeah. and all those influences, yeah. which are invisible in Washington will, will prevail? Uh, well, there's definitely that danger. I mean, not just invisible influences, although that's very important, but also, of course, the Congress. Uh, America is a presidential system, but it also has a very strong parliament, and uh, uh, much as in, in, in Britain and in any country, these elites which will continue after, uh, if, after the election of Trump, if indeed he is elected, uh, they will, I'm sure, try to prevent him if he tries to implement some of these more radical policies. We'll have to see, we'll have to see. Uh, he has surprised everybody so far. Uh, a few months ago, nobody thought he would win the, president, the Republican nomination. He's managed to defeat the skeptics. You know, nothing succeeds like success. And uh, he may, it may be that if he's elected in November, uh, people will start to follow him. Because he is... Uh figure, political figure, outside of any exactly um, any n normal exactly uh, position we we know he is uh, 
much more like a big showman. You know, like yeah, he is a big showman, but um, uh, in the United States, as in all European countries, uh, voters are aware that the two-party system, the, the centre-right and centre-left, is a game. It's a masquerade. Uh, and that, it's in fact, the policies are the same whether you vote for Republican or Democrat, Conservative or Labour, Christian Democrat, Social Democrat, whatever. <clears throat> I'm sure, I, I don't know whether it's the same in Macedonia. Perhaps a, a, little, a little different maybe in Macedonia. Uh, but anyway, this, you know, all European countries now are in that situation with the exception of, um, with the partial exception now of Italy, which has uh, the Cinque Stelle uh, winning mun some municipal elections. Britain has UKIP, uh, which has had success in European elections, in Spain with Podemos. So all over Europe, we're beginning to see these old systems uh, coming under attack. And the same is true of America. Trump has got Trump the... Trump is Podemos. He's there. got, he's, yes, but it's a sort of right-wing Podemos. You know, obviously he's going for the Republican nomination, uh, but he is not a part of the Republican apparatus. He is not a senator, he's not a governor, he's come from nowhere. Uh, so this is a, a natural movement, and it's one that, uh, you know, I hope will, um, you know, will release us from this cartel, uh, because the cartel in, in the United States is extremely strong between Republican and Democrat. There's basically no difference. Brexit and Russia? Uh, it won't have any effect at all on Russia. Um, uh, Britain has exceptionally bad relations with Russia, uh, unfortunately, and um, uh, even the people who have campaigned in favour of Brexit, who will now uh, presumably take power, uh, I don't expect that they will change that very much. Some Russians hope so. Sergei Sobyanin, the mayor of Moscow, thought that uh, this would... Uh, uh, reduce the uh, likelihood of sanctions continuing in the European Union, I don't see it at all. Okay, uh, that is the part about Brexit. I will ask you uh, a few short things now on the, um, uh, world geopolitics. Um, I, will, uh, I would like to, 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 hear your, to hear your opinion of uh, the present situation in Russia, they are trying to be calm. They are trying to to to, to be serious, and obviously, world global world is suffering for not having leaders. What do you think about? Well, I mean, uh, Russia obviously in recent months has. Uh, dramatically increased its uh, international prestige with the intervention in Syria. Uh, last September, nobody expected it. Everyone was taken by surprise. Uh, and for the time being, at least, it has made a substantial change to the way that Russia is treated. Uh, Kerry and uh, Lavrov speak every day now on the telephone about, about Syria. Uh, when Lavrov was, when uh, Kerry was last in Moscow, he <clears throat> he repeatedly said how important it was to cooperate with Russia and so on. Uh, the Americans, I think, are probably playing a double game. They're speaking the language of cooperation uh, while continuing to work for the overthrow of Assad. <clears throat> but the overthrow of Assad has failed. It uh, failed uh, to materialize in 2011 when the rebellion started. Uh, and, of course, the Russian intervention has meant that the Syrian government has been taking back territory from the Islamist rebels. We'll have to see. I mean, uh, obviously, a lot depends on the American election. The Americans tend to provoke new crises, uh, leaving old crises to fester. Um, we'll have to see what happens in Ukraine. The situation is is uncertain. Nobody uh, mentioned Ukraine anymore. <laughs> exactly. Ukraine has gone off the, off the radar. Like, uh, like uh, Georgia before. Yes, exactly. Like um, Russia is essentially defensive at the moment. And indeed, one of the things about Putin, despite his reputation 
for being uh, this amazing, uh, uh, you know, manipulator and chess player and so on. In fact, Putin as a politician is extremely cautious. He's a very cautious politician. He doesn't intervene proactively. He tends to calm things down and wait sometimes too long, uh, some people say, for situations to uh, evolve or stabilize. Um, so it's difficult to say. I mean, the latest developments are that, of course, Russia's relationship with China uh, is deepening. Uh, Putin has again been in China, uh, and there are you know, yet more energy deals and so on uh, being signed, and yet more statements between Peking and Moscow of um, an agreement, uh, of a general agreement uh, between the two capitals on you know, the big issues of, of the world. Um, so, as I say, the Obama administration is coming to an end. Um, we may be in for a quiet summer, and then we will have to see what happens when a new president is elected. The last question will be about the media, because I am interested in the media, because that's my profession. What do you think about media now in, in Europe, the media you are following, the professionalism in that media, the ethics in that media? Because the European Union is, uh, um, and the office of European Union in Macedonia, on a level of every minute is uh, pushing us with uh, that, that there is no professional media in Macedonia, no ethics, no this, a lot of hate speech, a lot of this, a lot of that. But I am trying to find um, examples how can I work here in Europe and I'm not finding it at all. The, 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 well, I've got two things to say. Firstly, the, what the European Union does in countries like Macedonia is a disgrace. They are just trying to... They, we talked about commissars earlier. They are the political commissars of, uh, of, of the media. Countries. Of the media. Oh, okay. And they are oh, of those countries, of those countries and of its media. So they try to police what is said in public opinion in civil society. It's a grotesque joke. It's not even funny. And uh, I'm well aware, I'm, well, uh, I'm very familiar with what they do uh, in Macedonia. It's exactly the same as they've done all over the former communist countries. Um, they uh, basically say that only pro-European, pro-New World Order uh, view, post-national views are permitted, and anything which deviates from that is undemocratic. So that is the first thing. The second thing is that the media, uh, by, by and large, in Europe are also very, very bad. And they are as guilty of uh, propagating propaganda uh, as, uh, as these political commissars. In Germany, for example, uh, the big media are completely propagandistic. Uh, for example, in favor of the European Union or in favor of the United States of America. Uh, in France, the same. Uh, the newspapers, the television, there is a uh, massive uh, uh, collective view which effectively comes down to the same thing as propaganda. Uh, as if attack on the world. world. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and as a result, as a result, there is a very low level of uh, trust uh, in the media. Uh, that's absolutely certain. Uh, the, uh, our friends in Germany, our friends at Compact Magazine in Germany, refer to, and indeed in the Alternative for Deutschland, they refer to it as die Lügenpresse, the press of lies, the press that tells lies. Um, the same could be said of the French media. The situation in Britain is a little bit different. We have a much more strong, much stronger press uh, freedom, particularly with the newspapers, and to some extent in the electronic media as well. Uh, but uh, in France, for example, the, uh, the confidence in uh, uh, national newspapers is extremely low, and indeed they have very low circulation. And uh, how the ordinary people can inform themselves? Well, obviously a lot of people uh, use uh, uh, internet sites, they, use, they go to blogs that they find uh, congenial and which give them information and so on. I mean, I, I think that that... Uh, has its own disadvantages because people uh, tend to go to blogs that they like and where they read only things that they want to hear. So the internet can become an echo chamber. It can reinforce people uh, in their prejudices. It's not 
uh, it's not as good as having good journalists. You have to have good journalists. But I'm afraid that for decades now, um, the quality of journalism has gone downhill uh, for a very simple reason. It's that because there is so much free information available on the internet, uh, it's much more difficult to get people to pay for good quality information. Uh, the, the internet has flooded the world with words, and so the value of words has gone down as a result. Uh, and uh, we see this in uh, major news outlets, major newspapers and so on, cutting back, sacking employees, cutting the number of journalists, cutting, for instance, uh, number of reporters, cutting foreign correspondents and so on and so on. So, uh, uh, we can con uh, the conclusion is uh, that uh, people here in Europe, in France, they don't trust media. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you go, if you look at any um, uh, article, I look at uh, very often look at articles about Russia, for example. The the article will be very hostile to Russia, and then in all the comments below, you will see that people uh, take the opposite view. You, you get that uh, all over Europe. I would like to inform you that uh, uh, last a uh, year and a half ago. The ambassador of OSCE in Macedonia, um, he, ha he had an official statement forbidden to forb uh, he forbid all other media to contact me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, one two months ago, I have uh, also my show when uh, all the all the I would, the words which is not um, uh, correct were with uh, sound signal teeth but Incredible. the words was were Rockefeller Rothschild yeah 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 United States Jess Bailey that's the ambassador in Macedonia what kind of system is that? people uh, talk about the Nazi period all the time they say. Uh, we all remember the 1930s, the rise of the Nazi party and so on. Uh, the fact is that they, uh, they uh, remind us of these events which are now a long time in the past, 80 years uh, in the past. Nobody is still alive then from then. And the, but the constant talk about that period uh, causes us to forget, in fact, uh, much more recent experiences and how those came about. And I'm sure that what you've described now I expect that if you were a, a Yugoslav uh, correspondent, I don't know, in 1945, 1946, you would have observed the same slow or perhaps not so slow process by which the, narrow, you know, the margin of permitted discussion was narrowed and narrowed and narrowed, almost without people noticing or with only a few people noticing. And then by the time people noticed, it was too late. John, thank you very much for this interview. Hope that uh, I will see you. We will see you in Macedonia. I'd like that very much. Soon. I wish you uh, uh, good health. And uh, I wish you the very best to your family, to your kids. Thank you. And to you. Thank you very much. Почитувани гледачи, драги гледателки, тоа беше емисијата со Джон Лакланд во центарот на Париз, овека во близината на на, на е, локацијата каде што се наоѓа премиерот на Франција, каде што ви понудив е, мислење и гледање за нештата за светската геостратегија и Брекзит од човек кој тоа исклучително е, детално го следи е, и човек кој за тоа е постојано присутен и прашуван, односно учествува во дебати во најреномираните телевизии во светот, пред некој ден на BBC, на Russia Today, на французските телевизии, па мегу другото, ете од светски е, те големи брендови и на Канала 5 телевизија, односно во Милен Кралковски шоу. Се гледаме следниот петок, пријатно и со здравје.